Good afternoon and welcome to our um, EdenNAP webinar on online civic engagement and service learning in hybrid realities and implications for the real world and the, the metaverse. So I'm very pleased to give you a warm welcome to this event. Please feel free to say hi in the chat, say who you are and where you're from. And I'll just uh, hang on for a couple of minutes and uh, till I see a stable number of participants, give people time to connect and then we can um, and then we can start. I can present my speakers and uh, give you a bit of a brief introduction to the uh, to today's topic. I'm going to do the same here. It's nice to see a good, broad um, European participation. I guess it's a good time of day for that uh, this sort of event. I must admit, when we put this together, I was seriously tempted to have this event at uh, 22 minutes past two, since it's the second of the second. I thought that might look uh, quite fun, but uh, I think five o'clock is a, a more um, a more standard and traditional time for our, our Eden Nap uh, webinars. Okay, so um, I'd like to get started because uh, of the of the time issues. We got quite a lot of speakers today. I'm looking forward to their their presentations. So, as I said earlier. Um, okay, before I actually get started, one last uh, point. Please use the chat for general conversational issues that you'd like to bring up or mention or to say hi to people, but use the question and answer tool for actual questions that you'd like to ask our panelists, because otherwise I'll, I'll lose them in the, in the, the messages in the chat. Okay, so, so, so please try and, and do that for us. So as I said earlier, today's webinar is on online civic engagement and service learning in hybrid realities. So the implications for the real world and the, and the metaverse. I mean, as it says in the description for this event, I think we've seen over the, the pandemic, a lot of our interactions and the sorts of events that we do typically in the real world, we're doing it online. Town halls, educational institution, uh, political groups, we are now meeting online and that's giving us a chance to actually engage with people in that particular context. And um, to, to some extent, we're moving back to the real world because the pandemic, hopefully, is beginning to, to, to finish. We're going to be able to go back to our interactions with people. But at the same time, our presence in the online sphere is going to be getting bigger. I mean, we're, we've now got people talking about this metaverse, this, this extension, this new reality for what online interaction will be, including different aspects of virtual or augmented reality, etc., with different kinds of function. So in a way, we're going to be tempted to stay online longer and not come back to this, uh, this real world. But the reality is that a lot of the, the, the real world questions that we have to deal with are in the real world. So the, the difficulty here for educationists, if we're helping our students and younger people in being able to, to relate to these different realities, the real world and the, the metaverse, is exactly how we can do this. And I think, or rather we think, that um, this is where service learning can actually come in and it might actually change the way we, we relate to people. Okay, so I'm going to shut up now and uh, present my speakers and then hand over to the, the first one to start. So to begin with, we've got um, Christina Stefanelli, who's a project manager at UniMed, the Mediterranean Universities Union in Italy. We've got Anna um, sletcher makiewicz who's um, a higher education project manager from the Institute for Development of Education in Croatia. We've got Berta Paz Lorido, who's an associate professor of physiotherapy at the University of the Balearic um, Islands. Um, her colleague, Alvaro Riviera, who's at the European Observatory of Service Learning in Higher Education and is also a, a researcher at a, a different uh, Institution. And finally, we've got Marteli Vineman, who's an assistant professor of migration law at the Viet, uh, Universität in Amsterdam. So thank you very much to all of our speakers. And I'll hand over to Christina now to get the ball rolling with the first presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, good morning, good morning, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, thank you, Tim, for, for the introduction. Thank you, Eden for organize, having organized this webinar and thanks everybody for from the Eden community and beyond for, um, for your participation today. Um, I'm Cristina Stefanelli, I work at UNIMED, uh, the Mediterranean Universities Union. Um, UNIMED is a network of universities in Europe and uh, in South Mediterranean countries. 
we are a network of 140 universities uh, and we're based in Rome in Italy. Uh, the aim of our network is to promote collaboration among the higher education institutions uh, in the Mediterranean region to enhance institutional, economic, cultural, and social cohesion of the area. So this is a general and very broad objective. We work on a number of priority areas, uh, autonomy of higher education, social responsibility, um, learning innovation, higher education in crisis situation, and in particular, we work with um, refugees and migrants and the, and the integration of refugees and migrants into higher education, um, research and innovation. Um, we work through um, what we call subnetworks, which are basically, and I personally work on um, a subnetwork which is called uh, a learning and open education, uh, which has been uh, running uh, before the pandemic, let's say. Um, and what we try to do is to facilitate the digital transition um, of universities um, into, yeah, in particular uh, through the use of open education and open educational resources. Um, I'm really happy <laughs> that we have the opportunity today to talk about the metaverse. Um, I'm curious to know what the other speakers uh, will say about this. Um, what I can say is what the metaverse is not. Um, most likely, um, well, for sure, the metaverse uh, is not, will not be uh, the land for the techno fix. Um, in other words, uh, digital technology alone, as we all know, uh, will not transform education, nor civic engagement and participation as such. Um, thanks and due to the crisis and taking also the opportunity of the crisis, we need to move beyond this very basic idea uh, of digital technologies that can offer like ready-made solutions to long-standing problems and, and also move from this old idea of disruption into technology as a tool uh, for mitigation. Uh, innovation in, in civic education, uh, which is what we're talking about today, uh, is an incremental change. It, it, it will not happen. It, it doesn't always have to involve high-tech technologies or, or super sophisticated devices, uh, but we have seen that any type of technology, including uh, lower tech approaches, can, can work just well. And during the pandemic, we have seen examples uh, of countries uh, using the TV and radio uh, to deliver educational content, and that was just trying to ensure uh, the continuity of, of education. We have also seen that um, universities are probably uh, more resilient than we, than we expected. Um, and probably the sector may have surprised itself. Um, and universities in, in the Mediterranean region and in Europe have demonstrated an unknown ability to reinvent the ways that they work. They have the ability, uh, the power, the flexibility to manage significant changes. And we, I think, have reaffirmed the role of the social responsibility of universities and the role of universities in uh, um, facilitating civic engagement, democracy and participation. However, uh, we need also to address issues uh, such as social injustice, inequality, the digital divide. We have been talking a lot about this, uh, as well as concerns about surveillance, ethic, data privacy, and all those issues which result from the dependency from online solutions. Uh, we at Unimed are working uh, on a number of projects and initiatives related to social inclusion, uh, in particular related to um, the inclusion of migrants and refugees into, into higher education. Um, it's pretty clear that those uh, groups, um, there is a risk, let's say, of social inclusions uh, of those groups as newly uh, arrived migrants um, are at higher risk of feeling detached 
Um, they have a lack of social identity, a sense of belonging, a social engagement, which is um, sometimes missing. Um, along those lines, um, we um, started working on, on a project, which I will present to you today, uh, which is called Nexus. Um, and aims at promoting the nexus of migrants through uh, active citizenship. Um, we try to innovate uh, the civic educational process, um, and this, as this may result in an increased participation uh, of students in, in their community, both online and, and in real life. Uh, Nexus uh, is an Erasmus Plus project funded by uh, the European Union from September 2019 to August 2022. Um, it's coordinated by UNED and, and the wonderful team um, composed by Team and Bea, who are with us today. Um, Nexus focuses on empowering students to exercise their rights uphold human values and contribute positively to the society around them and the global community uh, in general. Um, we, um, we, we work to produce mainly three things, um, a MOOC on civic education uh, and a learning community, um, a guideline for higher education uh, on community engagement and service learning, and an inventory of digital tools for open democracy and digital citizenship. Um, we have produced this MOOC um, last year, uh, which is called Civics uh, 4.0, Active Citizenship and um, Participation in the Digital Age. Uh, it's composed by six modules. You can see the modules uh, here in the screen. Um, it is targeted to anyone, uh, basically, but we try to focus specifically uh, on students and the educators uh, from diverse backgrounds. Uh, the MOOC is composed by explanatory materials, case studies and videos, um, participa uh, participative tools, there are self-evaluation tests. Um, when we have piloted it, uh, we offer to the participants reflection and collaborative activities through forums and Padlet discussions. And at the end of the MOOC, participants produced a project work uh, on how they were planning to take action in being more active um, and engaged in and engaged. Um, in, in, in their activities and in their societies. Um, these are a few numbers about the MOOC. We had 320 participants on 30 nationalities. Um, the um, completion rate is the usual completion rate of the MOOC, but the good thing is um, that uh, 15 um, of them working alone or in groups produced um, the project work that um, I have mentioned before sharing uh, their plans um, on how to use digital uh, tools um, for um, active citizenship. Uh, based on this experience, um, we are now launching, and Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that today is the first day that we are talking about this community in a public webinar. Um, this community, uh, which is called Nexus for Civic Community, um, which is a learning community where uh, participants with an interest in active citizenship and participation can share the resources that they are using, the tools, the digital tools that they're using, uh, and, and also um, share their experiences and how they are using those tools and, and other resources. Uh, I will share with you uh, uh, a few information about this community in case you have an interest in participating. This is the link and this is how it looks like. Um, there are, we are collecting materials um, that people can read and watch and case studies to get inspired 
there are also educational um, contents. And there is also the opportunity uh, with this link, which is at your resources to share um, to share your resources, to share something that you are using and you um, you you deem it's particularly relevant to to to, to this field. This tool is pretty simple. I don't know if you know uh, this plot things, which are just um, it's just a plugin for WordPress uh, that anybody can can use pretty easily. It's an open web uh, tool which makes uh, particularly simple uh, and possible to post resources and activities in an accessible way, and most importantly, um, allows user to do that without creating accounts, so we're not um, collecting any personal uh, information. Uh, so I invite all of you to uh, take a look at this platform and to contribute if you deem it appropriate. Um, you will find a collection of, of resources related to civic uh, tech tools. Um, there are uh, a variety of topics. I think Asuana will talk about this uh, later from dig digital civic engagement, digital identity, uh, participation. There is um, content about digital footprint and online and online privacy. So what we are trying to do um, with this project and in general uh, with this community and with our activities uh, is really to uh, bring uh, all the stakeholders together because we really need uh, to work all together to try to make this uh, transformation happen uh, in, in education and, and civic engagement. Um, I will stop here by now. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, this is my email address and thank you so much. Thank you very much, Christine. That was a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, we have a couple of questions that are, are not coming via the platform. One particularly nice question is about life histories and developmental biographies and uh, how can they be developed to uh, illuminate a kind of service learning continuum. But I think I'm not going to ask you that question. I'm going to save that for a little, a little later because I think that's a good one for a, a general uh, debate to the end. I mean, of all the things that, that you said, I remember one thing that really stood out to me when we were doing the MOOC was how many Italian students were actually quite active in it. And um, I wonder why you think that's the case. I mean, is there a particular interest in, in this area in your country? Uh, well, um, I think I, I don't I don't I don't see a, a specific a specificity in Italy why students are more engaged than others. We have had in the MOOC also uh, a lot of um, students from Spain. But what I think happened in this MOOC in particular is um, that we had a lot of students from the same areas and the same universities and communities. So uh, I think that what happened has been that a couple of them start, started working around those topics. And as it always happened, you know, um, then they have involved their, their communities around them. Okay, uh, thanks very much. And uh, I think, as you said, one of the, the interesting thing was the degree of commitment of the students working on the projects, because usually most MOOCs have very limited uh, self-assessment activities and don't really imply any commitment on the part of the students. And it was really good to see that. Okay, I'm conscious of the time, so let's move on. Thank you very much, Christina. Anna, can I hand over to you now, please? Sure, thank you, Tim. Um, thank you for inviting me. Thank, um, thank you, well, all the participants, for, uh, for watching now. Uh, my name is Anna Skrindal Matijevic, and I come from the Institute for the Development of Education from Croatia. We are a relatively small organization, but with uh, uh, 20 plus years of experience in dealing with um, higher education policies, uh, one of them being uh, community engagement. So um, just allow me to share my screen. Uh, so this is what I will be talking about, basically service learning as a form of community engagement uh, of higher education, because this is where we actually have quite a lot of experience. So uh, we have um, um, we have had uh, one 
quite successful uh, European project uh, called TEFTI uh, towards the European Framework for Community Engagement in Higher Education. And now uh, we are um, one year into its um, uh, uh, continuation called SHEPSI, uh, Steering Higher Education for Community Engagement. And uh, my colleague has also uh, prepared a report uh, called Community Engagement in Higher Education Trends, Practices and Policies. So this is a, a topic, this is a policy that, that we are very uh, invested in and we have invested quite a lot of um, work and energy uh, into developing a tool uh, for self-assessment uh, of higher education institutions. So actually a tool that higher education institutions can use to um, assess how engaged they are with their communities. Obviously, we uh, believe that this is a very important policy. Uh, and uh, I will just start with uh, our definition of it. So um, uh, we have three elements that are very important. Um, the first one being engagement, uh, meaning all the ways that a university or a higher education institution of any type, uh, its staff um, interact with, uh, with their communities uh, in mutually beneficial ways. So not just as part of the teaching process, but uh, as part of all the processes that go on in a higher education institution, which include research, uh, um, um, also um, other ways of um, uh, forming um, allies or um, forming um, initiatives, starting initiative, initiatives with partners from the community. And the community uh, can actually mean different things in different contexts. So um, a definition that, that we use uh, is communities of place, identity, or interest. Uh, this can actually mean very different things in different settings. And this is what we have learned through the process uh, of these two projects that, that I have mentioned. So we have learned that uh, community, for example, in Spain and Catalonia, basically refers uh, not to, to the immediate community, uh, but to a territory which is um, regional, let's say, regional level. In Croatia, it would mean uh, something more local, uh, referring to a local authority, so to the place where, where the higher education um, institution is located. Uh, in Austria, it would mean uh, most probably the business community because their engagement is uh, primarily um, oriented towards forming um, links with the business community in terms of uh, securing um, career paths for, for the students. So uh, community is very context-specific. And um, the third element that, that community engagement includes are societal needs, uh, which need to be addressed through community engagement. So uh, this basically refers to all political, economic, cultural, social, uh, technological, environmental factors that influence the quality of life within society and higher education institution should participate, should not be detached from the, the community it is a part of. Um, so what we have learned, so, so what we uh, take from the projects that, that, that uh, we have participated in and are still participating in uh, is that uh, community engagement is an integral part of university's third mission activities. Uh, but somehow in terms of policies, it has been marginalized. Uh, there is also no one size fits all approach because uh, community engagement, uh, so communities being very context specific and meaning different things in different places, uh, actually uh, this result uh, results in the fact that you cannot do community engagement in just one particular way. So uh, you will have to, um, um, you can observe many different types of engaging with, uh, with communities in different contexts. Um, it can fulfill uh, different social purposes. Um, and basically, it goes beyond corporate social responsibility. Um, it is about mutually beneficial cooperation between the higher education institution and its community, whatever it might be, but beneficial to the higher education institution, meaning to the institution itself, to the institution level, but also to the teachers, the teaching staff, to the management, to the students. Uh, on the other side, you have the community, which has to take something from this cooperation as well. It has to be beneficial for the uh, community as well.
Um, community engagement um, actually can be done through all the levels of activities or types of activities that a higher uh, education institution performs that, that form part of, of all the, um, actually, the, 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 the whole what uh, a higher education institution means. So primarily it's teaching and learning, but it also includes research. Um, it includes service and knowledge, ex knowledge exchange, student initiatives, and um, overall university level engagement. Uh, what we see as um, uh, part of the teaching and learning, so community engagement through teaching and learning uh, is service learning, which is basically a community-based learning. So uh, using a teaching methodology um, that combines classroom instruction, community service, student reflection, civic responsibility. So this would be the way to engage with the community through this uh, aspect of teaching and learning. There are other ways uh, to do it through research. There are other ways to, to do it through service and knowledge, knowledge exchange. Student initiatives are uh, mainly bottom-up initiatives that, that find, in my experience, new and innovative ways of engaging with the, uh, uh, with the uh, community, uh, which sometimes, quite often, include activism as well. And the overall level, um, university level engagement can include um, things such as using the resources that the university has, um, actually giving it to the community to use. So um, be it for venues, for cultural and social activity, or to provide access to the libraries or other resources that uh, members of the community can use. Uh, but um, as I said earlier, we are focused on policies. We would like to see uh, community engagement more represented in policies. As I mentioned, um, there, we can't really say that there is um, a systematic policy uh, that would encourage uh, community engagement of higher education. So this is basically what we have been um, uh, working on for the past five years, to try to find ways uh, to influence the forming of policies uh, that would support community engagement. And uh, there are four possible ways that, that, that we have used, um, post, uh, four possible approaches. Um, one is uh, transforming framework conditions. So uh, basically uh, working on system level, uh, trying to embed community engagement in higher education and research um, on the system level. Uh, so far, we have been moderately successful because um, in the latest uh, EU documents, um, you know, talking, referring to, to, uh, to priorities, um, community engagement was mentioned. It wasn't, it wasn't mentioned as one of the priorities, but the term has been adopted and it has been mentioned in the text, but this is a start. So, as I said, um, we have been moderately um, successful, but we, we're not going to stop there. We're going to try to um, influence uh, forming of policies that, that would encourage community engagement. Then there are targeted supportive policies, uh, the ones that increase the prevalence and the quality of community engagement activities, also at system level. And uh, um, the third one uh, that that I will uh, say a few words later about uh, is incorporating community engagement into existing programs. Uh, so encouraging community engagement activities at the level of individual universities. And here we have had success. Um, also there are status quo or bottom-up initiatives uh, that are not really specific policies, but uh, actually are initiatives that, that still do have relevance and, and impact. Uh, so, um, Christina talked about the Nexus project. Uh, I'm part of this project uh, in the Intellectual Output 2. Um, and we had to face, we had to find answers uh, to two questions. How to increase the level of student civic engagement? So, as Christina said, um, the trend of students' uh, civic engagement uh, is downward. So, students are not really... Um, either very motivated or, or they, they don't see the, uh, the use of becoming engaged in, in, in civic terms um, 
Um, so becoming civically engaged because they don't feel that they their voices are being heard. So uh, how to increase that level of student civic engagement? And the other question is how to target newly arrived migrant, migrant students? Uh, because um, it is obvious that the newly arrived migrant students will not have a formed um, um, uh, identity or will have uh, will struggle with forming a new identity in the host country. So um, how to target them and encourage them to become more active uh, in terms of civic engagement. So our answer uh, was uh, basically implementing service learning because service learning um, allows uh, the higher education institution, institution to build stronger connections with the local community and to engage students with the local community. Also, um, through service learning, so societal issues uh, are addressed, and these societal issues can motivate students for further civic engagement, not just through the service learning program um, at the university, but also it can be the first step to, towards raising awareness and including them um, uh, in, in further um, ways of, of becoming more engaged. Um, how to target newly arrived migrant students was a really tough question because you can't really uh, say, okay, this service learning course is just for migrants, for newly arrived migrants. You cannot be that exclusive because um, uh, inclusion and, and openness should be characteristic uh, of higher education. So uh, after thinking about it for very long, after many discussions, uh, we have decided to try to use um, a foreign language course. So uh, the foreign language course be meaning the language of the host country. So uh, most universities offer courses uh, of the national, of the host country uh, language for newly arrived students, uh, be they migrant students or uh, just foreign students who, who join for a certain amount of time as, as exchange students. So uh, these courses exist and uh, uh, we think that, that this is a very good way to actually target newly arrived migrant students and to offer this service learning component in uh, these courses and uh, offer them the, the opportunity not just to learn language but also to get to know about the community, uh, to, to get to know what societal issues, what problems the community has to participate in solving the problem and uh, actually to be more motivated to participate further on. Um, so uh, the policy approach that we chose was incorporating community engagement into existing programs, uh, so uh, into existing language courses for foreign students. Um, we uh, have prepared service learning guidelines aimed uh, primarily uh, at the teaching staff. In a part, also, it refers to higher education institution management, but, but primarily aimed at, at teachers who want to implement service learning uh, we have tried to be very practical, to, to give practical tips on how to organize, how to prepare, uh, how to implement, how to evaluate, how to reflect, uh, so that not only service learning projects, so uh, sending students into the community would be successful, but also that this um, element of uh, achieving the learning outcomes would also be met. And uh, this semester, so, so the, the, the summer semester, uh, the University of Malmo will pilot uh, a service learning method in a language course, as I just described, and we're really curious to see how this works out. Um, also, we are preparing a policy document, which is aimed at the higher education institution level, which is uh, intended uh, basically to help um, uh, higher education institutions to uh, form a framework that, that would allow um, uh, such service learning initiatives to be implemented, uh, actually to remove the obstacles uh, that, that exist. Um, and uh, oh, Metaverse, I, I, I now see a typo here. Uh, so uh, talking about um, all those levels of activities in higher education institutions like teaching and learning, research, service and knowledge exchange, student initiatives, university level engagement, all of this has had to be transferred into the Metaverse. It has had to be transferred due to the pandemic, but it has been done 
successfully uh, for, for the most part. Although there is uh, quite, um, I, I would say, pushy narrative that, that online learning is a lesser form of teaching and learning. Uh, I, I do not agree with that. So my colleague and I have prepared a um, um, report on the impact of COVID on, on higher education. And uh, what we have found out is that um, teaching and learning and, and actually all these activities can be done online with some modification and with a lot of preparation. So the first reaction probably wasn't the, the, the best uh, you know, in early 2020, but so far um, there has been a lot of um, uh, opportunities to learn, to adopt new, uh, uh, new teaching methodolo methodologies that, that are applicable to, to the online learning environment. And uh, I firmly believe that all these things can be done quite successfully uh, in, in Metaverse. So service learning fits into the teaching and learning part uh, of, the, um, um, of the higher education um, institution activities. Uh, and I believe that it can successfully be transferred online, not without challenges though, uh, and not, not completely. I still believe that, that the part where students go to the community and, and do the service work still has to remain uh, face to face, but uh, the teaching part, the learning part that, that occurs in the classroom can, uh, without a problem, be transferred uh, online. So uh, uh, I hope that, that uh, we will see some good examples and interesting examples and that, that uh, the documents that we are preparing will help um, teachers and students and, and uh, universities implement uh, service learning. Thank you very much, Anna. That was an uh, inspiring presentation. Very interesting. I think you've uh, given us some things to think about. Um, I have some questions, and I see that um, Ivana actually has put a, a question in the, the QA tool, one for you and one for Christina, but I'm a bit conscious of the time, so I'm not going to ask you the questions now. If you want to answer in the, the Q&A tool, please do. If not, we can pick it up at the end. I'd like to hand over to Berta now, please, if you would uh, give us your presentation. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hello, good afternoon. Thank you again for uh, the invitation to be here. Uh, it is a short time, but I will try to present what we do in the observatory and to put a little bit of light on the, on the issue for today. And it's uh, service learning in the European context. What do we know and what is needed to promote civic engagement in time of uh, hybrid learning? Uh, first of all, I would like to explain that I would be presenting the first part of the presentation and the deputy director of the observatory. And, uh, and, uh, and in fact, I belong to the University of the Balearic Islands that is, uh, has a, also a long tradition on hybrid uh, learning due to the condition of, uh, of being several islands in the in the autonomous community and also Alvaro Ribeiro that is in, in Portugal he is, will join me in this presentation and he will present also our website in the way that uh, you know how the observatory is uh, established and how can you get the most profit of the observatory and for us also to let you know how can we collect your experiences on service learning in this case in e-service e learning. So, first of all, uh, even when we have little time, but it's, I think it's good that we have this possibility to explain uh, what we consider service learning, uh, because service learning, it might be uh, considered differently depending on the context uh, and also the tradition of the higher education. So for us, service learning in higher education is an experience, uh, experiential educational method in which students engage in community service, reflect critically on his, this experience and learn from it personally, socially and academically. So this is very important for us that we from the very beginning have this included in service learning. And then we can understand that sometimes service learning or, or some activity, we can in fact say that it's service learning once this activity is finished and we can see that the service was properly developed and the learning was also acquired. 
So uh, there are several areas in which uh, the service learning can be developed and, uh, and then uh, this uh, makes uh, possible for uh, service learning to be developed on site, but also online. It's true that before the pandemics, many times we considered online service learning just in the, when we had to give service in remote areas, in other countries, in uh, uh, maybe some uh, cooperation project. But the pandemics also show us that uh, it is not this situation anymore and the technology is here to be used and it can be used in many ways, sometimes just as a media, but in other cases, even educational uh, technology is an aim, an objective of service learning in which students, they create new material or they uh, evaluate or practice with new uh, technology. So it's important that we consider that and that we have uh, students, academics and community together. And it's important always uh, to, to take into consideration that the participation of the students is not only to uh, give a service, uh, the service learning uh, starts before with the design of the project. And in this design of the project, it's important to, to, to uh, identify to which extent this participation is being um, uh, mutual, mutual uh, and re uh, there is a reciprocity in the process. So these are the essential criteria for service learning experience and that integrates a meaningful service and meets real needs, which is very important to take into account. The service learn is linked to the academic curriculum, reflection is part of the learning process, community organizations are valued as partners, and the students have a strong voice. I'm gonna go um, again uh, to describe this just uh, very beginning and then we, we explain what the observatory is doing. In this case, we, th we consider e-service learning uh, as, a, as a course that is mediating with the information and communication technologies. And uh, the technology is, is, is there to help, but it also is changing the way in, in which we consider uh, service and which consider learning. Uh, and another uh, aspect that is important is to consider the relevance of the institutionalization of service learning because it's, 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 it's interesting, of course, it is very nice that these institutions have different uh, experiences and projects with uh, teachers that are particularly um, involved with the community. But for us, uh, from the, from the um, European Association, the Spanish and the Observatory, an important is also to identify in which manner these activities are embedded into the policies uh, of the, of the um, higher education institutions and service learning is not as, as a particular activity, it's more as a possibility and is, uh, it's uh, facilitated and with enough resources provided by the institutions. So what we do here, the observatory was created in, in 2019, and for us it's important to collect experiences uh, related to service learning, and that includes e-service learning activities, but we also work on disseminating and, and creating new resources. So um, it's a it's a permanent space for cooperation and exchange. So feel please see more than invited to join us. Uh, and we uh, in, uh, will try to, to disseminate knowledge on service learning in higher education in Europe to promote, collect and systematize relevant information and carry out research on the use of this methodology. So later on, when Alvaro shows us a little bit of our webpage, you could see in which uh, aspects uh, you, or where can you um, include your experiences if you have some, or where can you make use of some of the products and reports and resources that we created. This is some um, information about uh, the experiences that we have collected so far. Um, uh, we have like one, 104 uh, service learning experiences collated from 19 countries and 34 from, um, from 14 countries that they, these are experiences particularly related to uh, COVID times. And so it's, it's uh, service learning in, um, in, in COVID um, um, service. 
this is some of the reports that Alvaro will show later. And just to show you that related to the topic of today, there are some practical guides on service learning in response to COVID-19. And there is an annual report from this year uh, in which part of the report is focused on e-service learning. In fact, part of my, my presentation is coming from this report. And also this late uh, last uh, document regarding the institutionalization of service learning in higher education that will finish with some uh, uh, the document that there are some guidelines to uh, help the institutions to promote uh, service learning. Uh, and these guidelines uh, are developed as a general uh, trademark because we consider that uh, these guidelines have to be contextualized. So of, when we talk about this uh, online uh, learning, there are some architectural layers. So for here, I wanted to talk about some types of service and that's what is more common that is the direct service learning that is also what is more present in the in the e-service learning experiences that we have collected in the observatory. But the other experiences uh, of service learning that are research-based service learning, advocacy to take awareness about the topic or even indirect service learning. And we also have uh, the experiences described into different types of, um, of, of service learning activities, like for example, hybrid type one, when the service is uh, on-site and teaching is online, the opposite for a hybrid type two, and hybrid type three is a blended format. But we also have quite a lot of, uh, of uh, service learning uh, um, experiences that are considered or that describe as extreme service learning when they are completely online. And here is just to show that uh, how this uh, product can be developed, but we can uh, talk more uh, later also. Um, this is an example of one of the activities that is uh, now have been collected in our website and EO Comité, I'm like you, and here have to see uh, uh, in this case um, Irene Kulkasi presented her, the, the activity with her students and there is when they describe the services that they were doing, which kind of, uh, of learning, how the, how the project was developed, in this case bottom-up, and also, if you see in the bottom, they explain it's advocacy, service learning, and it's extreme e-service learning because both serving and learning occurred online. So these are the toolbox that we also have on our web page that is um, we're going to share now. And also uh, we have the, like different resources and we collect some uh, information about uh, um, journals that are uh, writing this, particularly about service learning and higher education. And this is one of the, of the latest that we have included where all the um, 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 articles are regarding service learning and um, uh, educational uh, technology. And we are one of the of the um, networks. We work with the European uh, uh, context, but of course, it's important for us to to work uh, with in collaboration with other networks. So I'm very happy to be here, disseminate what we are doing, and of open doors to collaborate with other uh, institutions and and networks. So this is what I wanted to show. And uh, I don't know if we have some minutes for Alvaro just to present you the website. I see that Marta also is also here in the <laughs> in the group. She's the coordinator. So if uh, later I miss something, please, Marta, feel free to add. Thank you very much, Alberto. Alvaro. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes. Okay, so if you go to eos.au, you'll find um, our website. Okay. And here, you, if you click here, it's an opportunity you have to um, complete a survey about the institutionalization process in European higher education. Then the second is about the experiences, mapping service learning experiences. You can complete it here, sharing your service learning experience, and here sharing your service learning experience as a response to COVID. 
So we are running three um, surveys. And uh, based on this, we have developed uh, the annual report 2021. The title was Building on Seat Engagement During Pandem Pandemic Times. And uh, this report is made, up, uh, is made of two different parts. The first one is about findings of service learning experiences and responses, COVID responses. The second part is made of um, you know, a state of art of e-service learning in European universities. So the first part, you will you know, let you know uh, some information about the respondents, the institutions, the disciplines, the students, the service areas. And we, ha we have some, you know, some final um, comments about our own limitations and future research. And here on the, um, on the second part, uh, we have four different um, interrogations. The first one is about um, the, the social needs. The second one is about the design. The third one is about the technology. And the fourth one is about impacts. So this is our annual report. You can uh, access here, you go to our website, reports, click on reports. You have to wait a little and then it's here. You can go oh, here, the annual report. You can download it and you can take it for yourself. Now, we have developed also the research report 2021. The title was about the institutionalization of service learning. And um, this report is made of a context of the research survey, the design of the survey, the validation, our, some main findings and some final remarks. You can you can download the survey and you can have, you can access some risk, some figures and uh, how did we manage the research report? This is the validation process. This is an inductive. It's a bottom up initiative validation. And let me show to you. Yeah, here the first one. So we have 10 different categories. The first one is about institution involvement. We have the sentences, we have the level of evidence, we, we have a short comment, and we have you know, research interrogations for the future. The second one is about, fin sorry, is about funds allocation and financial methodologies. The third one is about uh, the coordinating unit and infrastructure. The fourth one is about uh, the rewards and recognitions of students and teachers. The fifth one is about teaching planning. The next one is about teaching uh, foundations. And the next one is about research. And uh, then about advertising and support, uh, social justice. And then I think, so, no, the partnerships, it's, a, it's the last one, right? So we have 10 different categories. We studied all of them. And for each of them, we have some, we have short comment and interrogations for future research. Also, we develop guidelines. And Marta will let us know when can we access those uh, guidelines. But uh, we have 10 different domains, the same one. We have the guidelines. We have supporting literature by European experts. We have supporting literature by non-European experts. We have the data. And we have, again, questions for reflection. Um, yeah, I won't say anything else because there is a lot of information here. Um, I don't, I don't know what could be more useful, but um, in terms of the website, uh, probably tomorrow we you will find here here the um, the guidelines, and and you can you can complete the surveys as I told you before. 
you can access the newsletter, the toolbox, resources. And you see, it is very important here, resources, because we have this, you know, um, e-library where you can access a lot of articles. I, uh, all day, you know, I've been updating the library with uh, articles, with European service learning articles from 2020 to 2022. And I, I have collected more than, you know, uh, 50, 60 different, Euro, different European articles. I, I'm not looking for North America articles, South Africa, Australia, um, China, or, but just European articles. And you can click here uh, by country, by, by inst institution, disciplines, type of materials, etc., and you will find, um, you know, uh, a lot of information um, about uh, European service learning. Um, and I think it's all there, though. Do you think? Uh, what do you think? Martin, would you like to say something? Yes, no, I, I think it's, it's good. It's good uh, because it's uh, still one presentation more. Maybe. I think that's uh, that's fantastic. Um, it's very impressive what you've done, and it's also very interesting to see this concept of e-service learning. Yeah. And uh, it's it's a shame that we have to move on, but uh, okay. um, we are we are a bit pushed for time. And uh, thank you for sharing the links in the chat, so uh, our uh, public has have access to that. And um, I think we're probably going to be. I mean, usually our webinars last around about an hour, and I can see us finishing about fifteen minutes later. But I think it's well worth it because of the quality of the information, maybe the the debate we can have uh, a little later on. So I have questions. Once again, I'm not going to be able to ask them to you right now. And um, if anybody else has questions, please use the question and answer tool to ask our speakers. And I'd like to move on to Marcelli now, please. Last but not least. Yes, thank you. Uh, does the sound work well now? Perfectly. Great. Um, let me see. I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to talk to you about a very specific pro uh, program that we're doing at the Freie Universiteit. So my name is Marcella Reneman, and I'm uh, an assistant professor in migration law. So I'm working for the law faculty. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our street law program. Um, so what is street law about? You, some of you might be familiar with uh, the concept because it's not something typically Dutch. Um, it is a program in which uh, students teach workshops about law in high schools. Um, and they don't lecture, but they give interactive workshops um, which, uh, well, they, they play games with uh, students, they play, um, they do debates, they do um, uh, mood courts or mock trials. Um, and the topics that are chosen for the workshops are typically topics that are relevant to the daily lives of um, high school students. Um, so, for example, in the Netherlands, we have uh, given workshops in, in Amsterdam about um, the prohibition of fireworks uh, in December or uh, whether laughing gas should be prohibited or um, um, internet security, um, cyberbullying, stuff like that. <laughs> um, and all the workshops are typically about uh, conflicting rights. So that can be about the right to privacy or the right to uh, freedom of speech um, and how those rights may be conflicting. Um, so our students that go to the high schools don't lecture, but they do uh, a lot of, they, they, they stimulate high school students to do critical thinking, you know, uh, why is the law as it is, how do you, can you imagine how the, the law should look like, um, so they, 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 um, they encourage high school students to, um, to think about law. Um, and I think this is also a good example of, um, yeah, community service learning and also engagement. Um, as I said before, street law is not a Dutch concept. It's something that started in the US, uh, United States in the 70s, I think, and it has spread all over the world. Um, so you can see some examples here from, for example, South Africa, where it played a, an important role in the um, the, str the struggles and the opposition against the apartheid regime. Um, 
And we, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, I, I, I started this two years ago. Um, we took over the concept, but we adapted it to the Dutch uh, context. So we... we I, said it, uh, I said it. Sorry to interrupt, but we're yeah. only seeing, we're not, I just realized we're not seeing your presentation. We're only seeing the first slide. I don't know if you got I'm on the sorry. Screen. I don't know what, what, what's oh, yeah. happening. I will, okay. I will stop share and, and try again. Uh, and hopefully then it will work. Can you see the second one now? Yes, yes, but we're we're seeing inside PowerPoint. We're not seeing the presentation view. Click on the the icon for presentation view. Right. Um, that's one. Yeah, here. yeah, that's right. Um, no, but we don't see it now. We only okay. Well, never mind. Just use the inside PowerPoint view. It's it's not a problem. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, sorry about this. I will. I'll show you the PowerPoint then. Hopefully, you can see it then. All right. So this, this yeah, is no, okay? that's fine. All that's right. perfect. I'll Thanks. do it like this then. Um, so um, the funny thing is that street law wasn't, uh, there weren't any programs in the Western part of Europe, including the Netherlands. So that is why I decided to start this at our university in Amsterdam. Uh, and we have been running this program for two years now. So the, the third uh, group of students has now finished their street law program. Um, Let's see. So what we, uh, just to give you a brief overview of what the pro program looks like, um, our program is part of a minor um, in, in the law faculty. Um, so the students that participate are uh, second or third year law students. And we have groups of in between 15 and 20 students, more or less. It's credit-based, so they get six ECTS for it. Um, and we do it with different with, with teachers from different parts of the law faculty. So some are specialized in administrative law, some in criminal law, um, and that way we can uh, properly supervise the, uh, the students that are going to the high schools when they're making their uh, lesson pl plans. Uh, we cooperate with four schools in, uh, in Amsterdam, and these are uh, different kinds of schools, so different levels, and we also teach uh, children of different ages. So some were uh, 13 years old, but we also went to schools where uh, the students were already between 18 and, and 20 years old. Um, of course, we prepare our students to do this. Um, so we give them a two-day training before they start preparing their own lesson plans in which they get to know the street law methods. So they learn about interactive teaching methods. Um, they experience street law lessons and then they start making their own lesson plan. So the, the second day they are already uh, teaching. And during, um, it's a one semester course, it's during the whole program, they get skills uh, trainings that relate to their work in the high school. So they uh, we, we train things like uh, giving feedback to each other. We, we um, encourage them to get to know the schools they're going to, but we also talk about diversity in education and things like social justice. Um, and of course, they have to relate all of that to the, the, the classes, the, the workshops they are teaching uh, at the high schools. Um, so they, uh, each, um, um, each student of our university teaches around six uh, workshops um, and designs around four lesson plans. Well, just to give you some idea, uh, a lot of students really, really enjoy the, the course. Uh, and that is also because it's, in most cases, it's their first practical course that they do. Um, and, you know, law is, is typically uh, about lectures and working groups. Um, and this is really uh, focused on skills. Um, some students really like going to the schools um, because they, they feel that they have a kind of a role model um, a position. And many, many high school students are interested in them. And we also go to schools that where there are pupils with, who have the same background as our students. So we have at the VU University, we have quite a lot of students from uh, um, who have a migrant background. Um, and they go to schools where also there are a lot of children with a migration background and they are very interested in, in the fact that they see their uh, the students that, that are 
in law school and they, they have lots of questions about that and so on. So that's really nice to see. But this is just one example uh, of a reflection report of one of the, the students, right? She says, to me, this, this is without doubt one of the courses of my law curriculum about which I will say when looking back, this is the course I benefited most from. This is the course where the lawyer in me surfaced, and this is the course which has contributed most to my uh, personal growth. Um, yeah, so can you do this online? Um, it is possible, of course, just after we, uh, well, in the second edition of our street law course, we uh, had also had to cope with the COVID crisis. Um, and then the schools were uh, closing, so we had to do something. Um, but we also experienced that it was really, really difficult, uh, especially uh, young. But we, we encouraged our students to prepare online classes for high schools, um, but we encountered quite some difficulties, for example, because uh, young children at certain uh, schools, they, they were... Uh, in front of a computer, but the, the teacher who was there wasn't really um, making sure that they would participate in the online class. We had some people, uh, some of our students teaching online classes and somebody broke into the, um, uh, the team's uh, meeting and started uh, yelling at people. So we had some, and then they stopped, uh, the school stopped it because they couldn't take responsibility anymore. But of course, there are some good examples as well. And maybe this presentation could be shared. There are some links to um, webinars about how to transform a street law program into an online program. Um, we, uh, so we started in Amsterdam with this program. And we by now, we have also taught some workshops uh, on how to start street law programs uh, in Belgium. Um, and I think. Also there, they're quite successful. Um, so there is some, some information here in Dutch. I will share that in the chat. Uh, but also there are online, uh, there, there's a lot available on, on how to teach uh, street law, especially from the United States. Um, if you're interested, you can always contact me. And just to, to, to close, I think this is uh, also something that can be do done in other fields of expertise, right? So this is the street law move movement is typically for law um, faculties, but I also talked to colleagues of mine who were uh, working for the physics department and who had ideas about buses with students going around schools to teach children about uh, more, you know, uh, physics or other more technical uh, kinds of um, uh, topic. So um, I think it's very well doable to do this in other fields as well. So um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Marthalia. I think it's a very uh, exciting initiative. And I must admit, if I had to think of all the uh, areas of knowledge where you could apply uh, service learning, I don't think law would be high up on my, on my starting list, but I think you've proved very well how effective it is. So can I ask our speakers now to please turn your... Um, your cameras and mics back on. Let's have a little bit of a debate in the in the five or six minutes we have uh, left here. And I think we've seen from our presentations that service learning can be taken online to a certain extent. But what I'm worried about is if we take it online, can we bring it back to the real world afterwards? I mean, if we're looking at this equilibrium uh, question, but I'm not going to ask that question first because I think uh, um, Alberto came up with a killer question right at the very beginning for all of us. So I'd like to ask this question. I'd like you to um, come up with your, give me your, your feedback on this. And this is, you know, we've there's obviously quite a lot of um, resources that's available and um, we have some information about the different initiatives and stuff that's been done. But the question he was asking is, is could we or rather, how could we um, bring together the life histories and developmental biographies in such a way to illuminate this, illustrate this service learning continuum and the way it actually uh, fits in with uh, civic engagement uh, behaviours? I mean, how do you think we could uh, go about doing that and what kind of sense would it, would it make to actually uh, do that. So, in fact, let me start off by asking you, Alvaro, could you ask the question? So I think you should get first attack at uh, answering it, please. Me? <laughs> yes, you asked the question. <laughs> so, um, the idea is to um, 
Listen, we are talking about service learning, civic engagement. Who is the um, most important stakeholder of service learning and civic engagement? I think it is the student. Uh, of course, we have teachers, we have um, community service, we have the boards, we, we have you know special teams, whatever. But uh, we are fo focusing the students, the youth, uh, the youth workers. We want to engage them. And uh, we are different. They are different. You know, uh, four years ago, I made a study for the European Commission about uh, refugees, migrants, and asylum seekers, people from uh, Syria, Yemen, and um, Turkey, you know, Sudan. And I had the opportunity to collect a lot of uh, life stories. I worked with, I managed this European research with uh, for nine uh, European countries. And it was amazing that how different we are. How different we are. So when we are talking about civic engagement, we are talking about people engagement, how to engage different persons. And for that to happen, I need to understand, I have to, under, I have to know their life stories. Descartes made a, a mistake and we cannot continue with that mistake. So we have to, you know, we, we have to listen to people and we have to build something based on uh, different life stories, you know, and uh, biographies. Biographies is very important. Self-biographies, people writing their own biographies. If you ask uh, refugees to write, to if you collect their life stories, it would be more uh, easy for you to, um, soci to socialize, to include, to uh, foster the social, social inclu inclusion of the, of the refugees if you understand their life stories, you know. So, but how to do it? Um, in the context of service learning and civic engagement between different European countries, different, different sub, subcultures, not cultures, subcultures, with a lot of migration rates, with a lot of refugee rates. So that, that's why it was a, you know, a question. Okay, thanks. I mean, it's it's a, it's a very complicated uh, issue, and I think it's a good question to to bring up. Can I ask somebody any, somebody else? I don't want to uh, particularly name and shame you, but um, anybody else would like to uh, say something about this? Uh, I am not looking for answers. <laughs> no, but it's uh, the question is worth it's worth asking. Albert, it's worth asking. Anybody else's uh, comments? So I raised my hand, Tim. So uh, oh, sorry, I'm much I'm, more screen. I'm not I need sure. To see okay. Sorry, uh, so I, I would like to to comment or actually continue what Alvaro uh, started to, to talk about. Uh, actually, this is a question that we need to think about. So uh, this is not necessarily a question that that we'll get an answer to, or that we'll have one answer that is only one correct answer. But, but this is the question that, that we need to find the answer to every time that we are in a situation that we want to implement service learning. We really need to observe the students and understand where they are coming from and not just a place, but also, you know, mentally where they are coming from and how this fits in this new community. Uh, but, you know, I believe that we need to do that anytime we are interacting with students. You know, to, we need to see the students for who they are. And service learning is a teaching methodology. So, so it, it's a method that, that you implement. But if you implement other methods, uh, you probably don't get to interact so much um, on such a personal level with the students. But still, um, it is my experience. And I, I've been a teacher uh, for almost 20 years that, that you need to build this relationship of trust and um, uh, you need to see the student that you are teaching and then you will be successful as a teacher. So um, uh, I, I see this question that Alvaro asked, uh, actually a question that we need to continue 
to, to try to, to find the answer to, to. So we need to keep asking ourselves the same thing. Great, Anna. Um, Berta, I can see your hand up, please. You're oh, my... sorry, sorry, I, I had my micro off. Uh, it's regarding the, um, some comments that we, we heard during the, this session regarding, you know, it's uh, online service learning, it's on site, to which extent can service learning be online? Uh, I, I think it's going to depend on, uh, of course, the situation in, that has to be developed and, and, and COVID-19 showed that this was the only way. Only way. But it's not only due to the to the context, also is maybe this is the aim of the service learning process to create so, something that is based on technology. And sometimes uh, e-service learning is the only way to give some types of service. So again, it's not uh, e-service learning a second class, but it shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't lose the components of service learning. It's not that we see some learning here and some service there, and that is mediated through technology that we are going to have a full e-service learning project. So this is important to do not miss in the process, the reflective part, the particip participation of the counterparts, etc. So this is just a comment. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much, um, but, uh, I think uh, for me, a key issue here is that of equilibrium, because especially in the first world, it's uh, very easy for us just to move online. And, and as online becomes more attractive, this whole the whole reason I use the word metaverse and not online environments in this in this uh, webinar description is I think that we're we're moving towards a really quite an attractive, immersive and absorbing um, online experience. But that might also mean a lot of people are being left behind in the same way they've been left away from formal participation and formal learning. So we need to sort of be very conscious of, of moving forward online, but coming back to uh, to supporting the people that aren't online because they might be the very people who actually want need our support more than, more than anything else. Okay, I'm still really conscious about the time. Can I have one final word from the people who haven't answered uh, these questions? Anything else you'd like to add to the mix? Um, Christina, for example, please. I see a hand raised by Marta, but oh, yeah, um, I can see this yeah, no, no worries. Oh, and Marta, Marta may want to go first. Okay, Marta, you go first. Sorry. No, no, it's okay, Marcella, please. Oh, no, Christina. Christina oh, sorry. Yeah, I, just, I, just, I just want to share a, a, a quick comment about um, the institutional approaches to service learning, to supporting uh, diversity. Um, I, I fully agree with Anna saying that um, professors, educators, and also administrative and the services within the university need to build trust. Um, and this requires energies, um, perhaps incentives. And, and many times uh, this is a task of a few professors who are engaged for personal reasons or whatever. Um, if we really want to, uh, for, for, for many uh, changes, but if you're we really want to mainstream um, those initiatives uh, and inclusion in general. Um, we both we need to, to combine uh, top-down and bottom-up approaches. So also the involvement of the strategic level of the universities having uh, those initiatives in, in their strategic plans um, and of the institutions. Um, so I think we need to, to work on, on both levels. Otherwise, yeah, um, in the end, those initiatives um, are not sustainable if they are an initiative or of enthusiastic educators who are often alone. Okay, Christina, that's great. I completely agree with you. Marta, please. Just to complement the words that Berta said, is like I was involved myself in a service learning experience, teaching, uh, giving um, support to school work to children, to vulnerable children in Madrid. And for the students, the experience was amazing because they ended teaching the student, the, the, the kid, the school boy, in the in within inside their home, you know they, they involve the whole family in the process of learning, 
and, uh, and supporting the schoolwork for this child. And that was something that in, a, in person or face-to-face -face learning, the, the, our university students will never go. So for them, the, the experience was very great. That's a, a really heartwarming example and very, very interesting and illustrative. Thank you very much. Okay, so I think it's time to wrap up. It's uh, we're 20 minutes over now. I'd like to thank our, our speakers and their presentations, and it's, they've been very, very engaging and interesting. I think we've got some open questions for us to think about. I'd also like to thank our Eden colleagues for having um, put this together and uh, and running it. The recording of this session will be put on, um, on the Eden YouTube channel and will be available on the Eden website. So once again, thank you very much indeed for, for being with us this afternoon. Bye.